All right. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the Department of Education Bureau of Student and Emotional Wellness. Today we have um, a panel of experts and they're going to be discussing the wellness needs of students K through 12, focusing on students with challenges during the, um, the lockdown, the social distancing. So we have, we've prepared a series of questions and we're going to ask the questions and our expert panelists will respond to them. But first of all, I'm going to do some quick introductions so you know who our presenters are. We've got Taylor Flurry, and she is a school counselor at Kearsarge Elementary School in New London. This is her eighth year working with students K through five in supporting their social and emotional well-being, as well as academic and behavioral needs. Taylor provides individual counseling, group counseling, and classroom guidance lessons. And as a school counselor, she also provides community resources. She um, organizes the peer mentor program. She's a representative on the school culture and climate team. She's also the section 504 coordinator and she develops transition plans and behavior plans. So thank you, thank you, Taylor. We're really excited to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Our second expert today is Lynn Cox. Um, Lynn earned her master's in education in reading from UNH in 1993. She moved to Proctor Academy in Andover, New Hampshire, and she is currently a learning specialist at Proctor, where she's been for 25 years. She's attended countless workshops and conferences on learning issues, disabilities, assistive technology, She's a certified coach for teens with ADHD, and she's a member of NEALS, which is the Northeast Association of Learning Specialists. So Lynn, we're really excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Lisa. Um, our last but not least panel expert is Katie Vediver. Katie's the Director of Access Resources at Colby Sawyer College and she works with students with disabilities and mental health challenges to provide them accommodations and services in the classroom and across the campus. Katie's a certified special educator in both New Hampshire and Vermont, and she holds an MED in special education from Boston University with an endorsement in specific learning disabilities. Katie, it's so lovely to see you again, and thank you, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Lisa. I'm really glad to be here. Fabulous. So without further ado, I'm going to ask you some questions and um, let, you, let you respond. So the first question that we have today is, how do you think students are feeling right now? So there's a lot of change in their world, in their education, in their lives, in the world around them. And they must be having, having lots of different emotions about lots of different things. So what are your thoughts on what students are actually feeling right now? I think there's a broad spectrum um, of those who have means and supports uh, to those that are really unfortunately experiencing family or financial crisis. It's, it's a big spectrum here. And for some students, I think they're in survival brain rather than learning brain. Um, the rug has just been pulled out right from them. Um, you know, we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the bottom of the pyramid, um, that food, that shelter, that safety, um, love and belonging, the foundation's kind of crumbling. So um, what do we do to help support them? So um, I think it's a really important topic that we're discussing today. And um, I think parents are really stressed, either job loss, food insecurity, um, they can't pay their rent. And I think these kids are taking on that emotional burden um, and they feel that, um, you know, they may show it through anger. They may project that. Um, they may act out behaviorally. I think for kids that are already anxious, their symptoms are um, elevated. They might have, um, you know, trouble sleeping at night, uh, stomach aches, headaches, racing thoughts. Um, so those symptoms um, might be more present and prevalent right now. So just be being mindful of that. And we've had kids um, as young as third grade actually, um, you know, feel hopeless and deeply sad and um, 
thinking of suicide ideation. Um, it's, it's a really sad time for us, um, but also a great time for us to get our supports in place and be there for these kids. And I hope that, you know, the more majority of our students know that all our teachers and school supports are just in their court, we're rooting for them. Thank you. And I would add that students, families, and educators have been working so incredibly hard to meet the demands of remote learning. And it's uplifting to see the creativity and the resiliency and the flexibility that everyone's showing as um, students and we all make these transitions. And I'm tagging on to what Taylor is saying about um, everyone's adapting and feeling a range of emotions. So feeling possibly unmotivated to do the work or frustrated by the workload or how we're, we students now need to do the work. Um, and also the feelings of disappointment um, with things being canceled at the end of the year, graduation being changed or move up ceremonies being changed to online um, and those end of the year activities um, not being the same. Also, there could be a excitement with the end of the year and the warmer weather, but then the uncertainty of how things are gonna be in the next couple of months. Um, so being cooped up at home, feeling the fatigue and exhaustion of that. So um, I also think a lot about the conducive learning environment and some students are able to create that workspace and others don't have um, the space that is as conducive or um, where there there even there's internet connectivity and that provides more stress for for students in order to get work done and um, even attend classes um, and school's important work's important but i really feel that what's the most important is how students feel and how they're being treated right now and everybody's really trying to support but as we go to the end of the school year and into the summer um, that's going to resonate with them and then when we're all together again um, just them feeling connected to the school yeah that's that's some really helpful feedback because when i think about all of the the positive things that they might be feeling and the negatives the the grieving and the joy it's it's a lot for any one individual to manage um, at one at one point so thank you so what do you think students need to be hearing right now from from their teachers and from their counselors I'll jump in on that right now I I would say I think the first thing I think of is is some perspective I think that um, they need to know this will pass and they are so live they so live in the immediate i think i of course I mean, with, with high school students um but most kids you know really are living in the immediate and um giving them perspective on you know that this this will go away it will be okay and it will go away um you know maybe not completely away but it's it will become it will become more manageable and so i think that's a really important um discussion to have. Um, I think it's really important to let them know it's where okay to worry and it's okay to be sad. That I think is, you know, calm, you know, the normal, that would be a great um, thing to make sure that they feel okay. With, yes, this is a hard, sad time. Um, having patience, trying to um, teach and model patience with difficulties and express, you know, patience for, you know, we need to have patience to get through this time. Um, I think that um, students really do know to, need to know the news and the truth, but I think that that's a great opportunity for teachers to really use it as a learning, a learning experience. Um, you know, for example, maybe talking about both sides of the um, stay at home rule where some people want to come out um, and be and not be staying at home and other people need to be staying at home well there's two sides to that story and so using that as kind of expressing letting kids know where you know where some of the stress is coming from everybody needs a job and and money and and to work but we also have to keep safe kind of presenting it as a learning opportunity too, keeping it um you know letting them know the news and 
keeping them updated on it, but keeping it as a learning experience. I think um, they primarily, for me in high school, again, I think primarily keeping them doing their job as students right now, reminding them that one of the best things they can be doing for themselves and for their family is to be a student and to keep learning and even um, in the any way that they can to be that, that their you know, job in life right now is to be um, learning skills and expanding their knowledge and um, kind of just keeping focused on academics is one of the best things we can give them um, and that they can hear, you know, you're doing a great job and let's keep learning. Um, I think it's so amazing to be a teacher right now, actually. I think it's just amazing um, because we're all working and we're able to keep going in this like some other people aren't. And I am so thankful to be able to connect with my kids every day and keep that going. Um, I think that's what they need to be hearing. It's I'd like to add that they need to, they need to hear that teachers understand where they're coming from and that um, they, they, of course, all want to be successful, even in the online learning environment and how stressful that can be as they adapt to the new way of learning and new way of life um, and just the abrupt changes that online learning has brought, um, but struggling with the loss of habitual structures and help and hearing that teachers will help them rebuild their learning habits. So everybody being affected by online learning and COVID-19 um, but affected differently. So hearing that even, you know, it, they're feeling different, they're missing their friends, they're, how are they getting along at home, but that there are supports for them um, and that we're all in this together, even though we're all feeling it differently. Um, and also to give themselves a break. So if it's not making sense, if online learning isn't making sense, it's okay to give themselves the break and come back to it later and ask for support. Um, I just, I often think about students at school and that there's a natural, um, they associate the school building and the school community um, and the school community missing them as much as, as, as they're missing their friends. Um, and just that we're all setting, resetting our brains during this, in this new environment. Um, and that we're, and teachers and school personnel are there to, to help them. Yeah, I'm just gonna piggyback on Katie and um, Lynn. And I think what's important for students to be hearing right now from teachers is, hey, let's stay connected let's be well and let's continue to learn the best way we can right now. Um, meet them where they're at. We know that they might have a low tolerance for frustration. We know there's a lot going on. So we just need to use some understanding, flexibility, optimism, and remind students that they can and they have done hard things in the past and we'll get through this. Great, right. that, that was a, a wealth of, of great information. So I'm going to move along to the third question that we have. And given everything you've said and the type of student who might be having some challenges right now, what do you think some really useful strategies are that educators um, can be employing to help their students emotionally specifically right now? Um, I have a number of them. I'll just kind of go through them. But um, I think just getting a general sense of um, how they're doing, check-ins. Um, I've seen on video meetings with our teachers and students, um, they do thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. I mean, we have elementary kids. Um, when I have small group sessions, I say one to 10, how's everybody doing today? Um, one, that's the worst day ever. Five, somewhere in the middle, 10's the best day ever. And just share a little bit about why. Um, and I think having that small group environment and this enables some um, familiarity and comfortableness that they can um, share what's going on. Um, and I, I have uh, created a simple Google form check-in that anybody can do. Um, just how are you doing? And there's some emoji images that they can click how they're doing, um, if they've tried any coping strategies, if they'd like a follow-up email or a phone call. So it's more of a discreet way of um, letting the teacher or the counselor know um, what's going on and if they need some support. Um, I think also Lynn Lines has talked to us all about not letting worry boss us around. So if we have any students that say, I can't possibly get all this work done, or what if I don't get it done? Okay, 
just calm down and let's talk back to your worry right now. Those are some easy strategies. They say name it to tame it. Um, so that's one, another idea. I think um, being flexible with the video sessions because they've had a lot of anxiety with kiddos that don't like to see themselves on camera. Um, so we say, okay, well, we'll just put a piece of tape over your camera or shut off the video and you can join into your class, you know, just listening. Um, auditorily and that's okay. I think again we need to meet them where they're at and sometimes they feel better about joining sessions um, like five minutes earlier than the other classmates do and again that's okay we get it. This is all new for us so it's a big learning curve. Um, I think also just being creative. Um, we want the students to be engaged and some of that is entertaining them. Um, you know we give them voice and choice to give them a sense of control. That gives them some you know, comfort um, in knowing what comes next and that they, again, have a choice in what they want to do. Um, we have a lot of um, choice boards where they can pick you know, three out of the nine things to get done. Um, and again, that gives them that sense of control. Uh, we've been doing Zoom prizes where we kind of jump in on um, classroom video sessions and there might be someone um, that's a surprise guest wearing a disguise. Um, someone might be wearing a Poppy the Troll wig <laughs> for the elementary students just to keep them engaged um, and wanting to come back and hey did you see Mrs. Lori pop in? Yeah you're gonna come to the next meeting. Just keeping it fun and I've had wonderful teachers do scavenger hunts and would you rather questions just to keep them um, engaged. We did a really fun um, talent show on Flipgrid. I think that's a really fun tool that teachers can use where you can, um, students can record something and other students or teachers can respond in a video format. So we had um, students climbing trees, um, teaching others how to do cat tricks, training dogs, singing, gymnastics. Um, a broad spectrum that was really awesome and spread some positivity. So that was really cool. Um, and then I, I think um, just using social emotional learning opportunities um, during this difficult time is, is very helpful. There's lots of read aloud books with SEL topics that I've given permission to share. And I think that's helpful to just be real with these topics. And um, we talked about the, the choice boards and they might be um, including emotion charades with the family member or doing a chore without being asked. Um, practice sitting still for a minute and focus on the sounds you hear. You can send home um, PDFs of breathing tracers where little kids can um, trace around the cloud. Inhale and exhale through the rainbow. There's lots of things online that we can send home. I think for older students, you know, one cool assignment might be um, come up with a playlist of how you're feeling right now. Um, and that's another window on um, how they're how they're doing. Um, write a letter to yourself or a friend. Um, for the little guys, we do um, make a happy list. So include images or clip art of things that just bring you joy and refer to it if you're feeling down, frustrated, upset. I mean, it could be images of listening to music, your grandpa, pancakes, soccer, anything that would just bring a smile to your face and we need some happiness right now. This is the time that we could use them silly. So um, silly is good. We want to do that. Um, and then I think just explore mindfulness. You could do a group um, guided relaxation. There's many um, options online that you can use um, for scripts and doing grounding exercises. Um, you could have a grateful challenge. Can you possibly come up with 20 things that you're grateful for? Um, and then I think besides the SEL learning, um, talking about transition planning and making them feel less anxious in moving towards the next grade and what does that look like. And again, we use Flipgrid for that. So you could ask your next year's teacher um, some questions and your next year's teacher could respond back. Um, we just made a really fun video for third to fourth grade transition where our principal walked through the building showing the different fourth grade classrooms and we interviewed current fourth grade students. Um, so that's just a fun way to kind of ease any anxieties with our, our students who are moving to the next grade um, next school year without that sense of closure and without that traditional step up day. Um, so I think that's all my strategies I have for now. <laughs> 
I can jump in a little too here. Um, I guess I, I thought about it in kind of a different way. I um, was thinking about what kinds of, you know, primary strategies really would be critical in the classroom. And I think one of the first things I've heard in, amongst my um, coworkers and um, teachers are also um, is that listening they've found to be such an incredible thing and we're you know they're in a in a video chat with a bunch of kids and they're realizing they are talking so much more than they intended and and um, that backing off and really thoughtfully giving each kid a chance to speak each student has been a chance to speak and say what they're um, you know how what they're thinking it's in within the classwork that they're doing or just as a conversation comes up to kind of let the conversation go but you know step back and let the students speak i think um, another thing that um, seems really important and i'm lucky to work only with two students at any point but um and so it ends up being one-on-one -on -one. but the classroom teachers also have found that being able to connect with each student individually in the class time has been we're trying to take that opportunity as often as possible to check in with each kid because it just is so there's you know they're really disconnected from the classroom and the teacher or can be in a classroom situation on um so that trying to make the connection with each student personally um is good for work wise and um to know how they're doing and then I think knowing the outside world, knowing what might be affecting them, also being thoughtful about um, what's going on in their world. Um, I know that uh, Ramadan is going on right now, and we have students on video chat trying to keep up with classes, and um, that is a, a you know can be a very difficult setting for a um, student. And then we're asking them to be online all day and. So just knowing, you know, obviously we can't know everything, but we can kind of can get a sense of what what might be challenging out there. Knowing that as a teacher just helps. I don't, you know, we're not bringing that up with them, but we, but it's good to know um, what might be complicating their world. I think someone said that before. Um, I am big on kind of staying with academics and just, you know, saying this is our structure right now. This is your structure for your day is to learn and to use this time. Um, the, our, you know, our academic dean said first and foremost that keeping it simple and keeping it quality was the most important thing, like thinking about what you're teaching and keeping it uncomplicated and essential. Um, just, to, and then changing your curriculum around that idea that um, it should be um, you really want it manageable. Like if we ever were talking about keep, um, keep it achievable, make it achievable, this is the time to do that absolutely um, in terms of schools. Um, understanding, I've had discussions with my kids about understanding how stress impacts the brain. Some, you know, going through the brain science at the high school level of why why um, all this stress can be really tough on us too. To explain to them, you know, not only are you online and you're trying to reconfigure your world, you're also under stress. And stress makes, you know, you not be able to think as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's a valuable thing to be thinking about. So uncomplicated, achievable quality assignments. Let's see, I had a little list here. Oh, stretched out, longer running things. If you're writing a paper, take a paragraph at a time instead of um, you know, one draft and then another draft. Um, you know, uh, don't, you know, while tech is great and fun, um, don't overwhelm with the tech. You know, I think sometimes we get too, too involved in all the cool things that we can do, but right now maybe it's best to do one, pick one or two, now and again, I think laughing obviously, obviously is really important and having fun and every day I try to find a way to laugh. I'm again lucky to be only more one on one, but boy, it's great um, to get them laughing and just be, you know, kind of silly about things. Be flexible, changing gears, I think, is a strategy someone else um, also brought up. Um, that's critical for a teacher right now. If this isn't going well, ch stop, regroup. <laughs> Think for a minute, take a pause, get up, get people moving, moving out of their class chairs, moving out of their seats, go fetch something. Um, take 15 minutes, go outside, find something. I know we have outdoor classes or classes in the sciences that are doing lots of projects that are outdoors. So um, 
And then, of course, incorporating fun is critical. Um, I know there were, you know, teachers doing bring a pet to school day so that, and if you didn't have a pet, bring a stuffed animal or bring a, bring your buddy and, um, you know, obviously rapping music, poetry, any other kind of thing that you can bring in that's arts um, related. Um, life, uh, one history teacher, you know, they've been studying history, but they dropped the history and wrote the paper on a life passion and had to do the research for their passion. So surfing or engines, or I have another student working on, um, uh, uh, I can't remember that, <laughs> but anything that had, a, you know, whatever their passion was, that they could go after that with a vengeance instead of writing the history paper right now, because that they're still working on the, the curriculum goals of writing and research. Um, create a, uh, Creating a road trip, like I had, um, there's a, you know, an English teacher who dropped the English curriculum to create a road trip where they all had to design the stops on the route. They had to pick their vehicle. They had to figure out how much gas they'd need. They had to, you know, create a music um, tape that they would go along. They had to pick through some stops across the country that they would do. So, and that, you know, was just a nice um, change and lighter subject to break up some other subjects that were going on heavier uh, duty. And then I think people, you know, writing about themselves right now is really important as well and um, assessing where they're at and, and um, journaling for themselves, whether that's turned in or not. I think that's... That, that was really good. And when I when my walk away is from listening to you talk, the one from um, Taylor talking about the, talking about the transitions into the next school year or the next, the next step of their life is really important for students right now. But Lynn, you were also talking about the very strong cultural context of Ramadan and maybe students not, 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 you know, being hungry and not being able to concentrate when they're waiting for sundown and um, being super flexible with, with, with the curriculum. Thank you. So my next question is um, really focused on students with disabilities and differences. How do you think, um, how, how can educators best support that particular population of student? I can go again. I think it's, um, it's really important. I, you know, this is, it's a really hard time for um, a student who, you know, high school students have hungry egos. They want rewards. Um, and a student that struggles with learning is really hungry for rewards when they can get them. Um, and right now, um, I would think that most, an awful lot of students um, that struggle with learning get their rewards through the arts, through music, through dance, through um, athletics, through social settings and um, love interests. I mean, the rewards come in actually almost every area that we can't participate in very well right now. So it is really important um, for people to be, for, you know, opportunities to be given for everyone to find an area that they love and succeed in. Um, the, um, so I'm, I think um, listening again is so critical for teachers to be listening. I mean, my job I know is, is accommodations, an awful lot of it. And um, to make sure for a learning student that has difficulties, I'm you know, making sure that they have reading, audio for reading, the, the, the basics, you know, the, and as long, audio for reading and also um, you know, dictation for writing or, um, templates for assignments and if they have those backdrops that's um, really important for making their work easier for them so uh, working together with the teachers to make sure they have the structures they need is really important right now um, understanding that success is critical for them and um, in, for them to be able to hang in right now at the, on in video classes Fabulous. Katie, you look like you're about to say something. So. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to, to add a few things. Um, Taylor earlier was talking about check-ins, and I agree how important that is, whether it's a email that's sent out or a small group that meets. There's been so much creativity in the schools with how um, teachers and educators are supporting students. So check-ins by email, small groups, even after class, checking in. And if students, some students might not respond, but they do appreciate the reach out. 
and feeling that the teachers care um, and also sharing of stories. There have been, as Taylor was talking about, pictures of pets. Um, what you've been doing, getting outside, the humor uh, that Lynn has talked about so much, everybody, and bringing a lightness to the situation um, because the, the, the supports that we're trying to put in place are often harder online, we're finding that, than it is in, um, in the classroom um, as we're transitioning and we're in that transition. But also talking about the workspace. So as a teacher, what does my workspace look like? And possibly are there challenges that I've experienced? So what have I done to set it up? What type of music might I be playing um, when I'm not in class with students but doing work? Um, was I working on a lesson plan and I lost it? Or was I doing a science experiment and messed it up and had to redo it? Um, so just ideas around that helping to reset the structure, but also that everybody has challenges, even the teachers in the online learning. Um, and then more supports, academic supports related, um, helping students break assignments down and being able to provide models. So if there's a project that uh, the class is assigned, often with students who aren't great auditory learners, they're learning so much auditorily through online learning that to show examples or models of what the teacher is expecting to help them get a better idea of what the end product is and helping them in agenda books or break down those, those assignments more. Of the classes, um, being able hmm. Okay, I, I think we've, Katie has frozen up a little bit here. So I can Am I back with you? You're, you're back with us, okay. so I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, recording of lectures helps students who get distracted while they're online. So if their phone's there and their computer's there, um, opening different windows, but if they can go back to to the video and then do their homework at a later time. So as, a, as folks are talking about options and not having a straight line to the end product of the assignment, but how can we put other supports in place um, for the students to, to be successful? That was, that was again, you, you're answering these questions. This is why you're here because you're experts. So um, we've got one last question. And the question that I, I thought we might end, end with is, what do you recommend that parents do to support the students right now? So you're, you're on one side of the screen and many of you are parents too. Some of you might, you know, have little kids. I've got grandchildren. So I've got the, you know, I sit as one side as an educator and then I turn my head around and I've got a, a grandson behind me. So what do you recommend that, that parents do right now to support their, children who might have a lot of challenges or fewer challenges? I, I see parents as master jugglers right now and trying to juggle the working at home or working out of the house with their students trying to get their work done and often for students with mental health challenges or disabilities their day can be longer so how are we helping structure and they're seeing so many different people oftentimes within the school day um, so how can we help them but at the same time create a balance and I've um, been interested in this idea of co-workers so your child is your new co-worker and you're your child's co-worker and can we work together for students who want that social closeness during social isolation? Can we work in the same space? And then maybe for the teenagers, giving them the space they need and trusting that they're doing the right thing. So questioning how they're doing, but really trusting that, okay, if you're in your room for three hours, I'm trusting that you're getting your work done. Uh, so, and I, I think that that's so important with everything that um, that everybody's doing and also doing doing some things that have nothing to do with school. So how can you make it lighter? How, you know, going out and walking the dog together, making a meal together, 
um, the parent being the sous chef while the older child is the chef and trying to break up um, the stress with with at home learning and with parents working at home as well. Just the resiliency and the flexibility once again has has been remarkable. Um, no matter what type of learner students are just how families um, there's really struggle and stress and um, the what we're learning now will help us in the future, but just how how much people have had to go through to, to make it all work. I'd love to jump in a little, yes, because uh, as a high school teacher, I think, um, you know, to having parents stay out of the way of academic work is really important. Um, you know, just, you know, the trust is right. They need to be able to, um, at this point in life, the students really do need to be taking on that responsibility and um, as much as they can, always offering support, always encouraging them, encouraging them to do, do the best they can, but not getting overly involved in the work is really important. <laughs> and then also, the you said outside time and family time, but also I think for teenagers, giving them free time away is critical. They need space at this point in their lives um, to be by themselves and be doing their own thing. And so getting them out on their own to take a walk or a run or um, being, um, you know, it, being in the room is okay um, at this point. They need space um, as well. That's, those were two key points for me. Taylor, you're, you're last. So you have the last say in our session today. So what are your thoughts on this? Um, so I'm thinking that parents can be self-aware, um, show calm because parents are modeling what calm looks like and feels like, especially to the, the elementary age kiddos. Um, you know, this can be very overwhelming and confusing. And if you are showing your child that you are panicked because you don't have enough toilet paper, well, they're going to pick up on that and they're going to um, act in an escalated way. And um, I think limiting access to news reports, um, if students are in earshot of parents um, having conversations um, about, you know, um, the number of people that were um, diagnosed today, things like that, it's just, it's not necessary. And I think it just adds stress. So just limiting um, access that students have and having conversations with your kids, checking in with them, validating. Yeah, there's a lot to be, you know, kind of scared about and sad here, but we're doing what we need to be safe. We're doing what we can do. Um, I think also, you know, um, being mindful of this is an overwhelming situation and if you can't keep up with all the assignments um, that your child is coming home with at the elementary level, it, if you have multiple children, there's different Zoom meetings at this time and this time and this assignment's due on this date. I think just shooting um, an email to the teacher, not sugarcoating it, but just saying, hey, we're in a place where we're feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, can you kind of just give us some bullet points of what we really need to, to get accomplished here? What's most important for us? And I think teachers are so understanding and flexible right now that they're, they're doing what they can to make um, students and families successful right now. And, and I think part of being self-aware is knowing when um, you need some self-care because this is so overwhelming as um, Katie and Lynn said that we're all just doing the best we can with what we have and um, maybe from 3 3.15 mommy needs some reading time or mom needs um, some time to go for a walk. Um, I think being kind to yourself as parents we can be our own worst critic sometimes so just remembering that. Um, also another um, strategy for parents I think is giving some power and control to our kids. Um, have them make the plans, give them some options. Um, little kids love chores or helper jobs and it just makes them feel good that they contributed to the family. Um, validate how they're feeling, have that conversation. There's fun ways to do that too. There's feeling scavenger hunts. So, hey, can you go bring me something that you feel proud of? Um, what's something do you like to do in the house that makes you feel silly or happy? Um, and who can bring it back for us? Just little things like that are a fun way to explore um, our feelings during this time. I think you can create, it's kind of silly, but um, a self-care plan for everybody in your family. So how are you gonna have a calm mind and body? Um, what are the barriers here? How are you gonna be a good friend to so-and-so? How are you gonna keep healthy? 
um, just be mindful of those things. And um, I think creating a daily routine, you know, knowing what will come next, um, there's a lot, a lot of comfort in that for kids and for really little ones, a visual schedule is, is great. Um, I think being connected. So those virtual play dates, it's something to look forward to. I've done that with my own four-year-old. Um, oh, we're going to talk to your friend Logan tonight. What are we going to talk about? And often it's just showing the pets or their bedrooms. You don't need to have a planned activity. It's just fun to connect with one another. Um, although sometimes it is fun to play Pictionary over Zoom. We've done that. Um, we've started a story and then the next person will continue and add on until it's just a silly story. You can laugh at that. Um, I think just doing FaceTime, Google Duo, any kind of video sessions you can with family and friends to keep that um, connection is important. Um, and we've um, been doing stuff for others too. So I think spreading kindness, you know, whether it's drawing a picture for our neighbor and just surprising it, them in their mailbox or writing a letter to a community helper, um, painting kindness rocks and spreading them over town. Um, doing something for others makes you feel good and comfortable in a situation um, that can be stressful. There's um, an action for happiness, uh, meaningful May calendar that you can look up and families can um, have one thing a day that they can do that's kind. That's really fun to explore. And um, I think as mentioned before, just having some fun. There's so much more time right now that we can spend with our loved ones. So let's really enjoy that and make the best out of it. And um, maybe that means having a special family movie night or treasure hunts with clues, um, making talk sensory paths. Um, as Katie said, you can make dinner, have the kids make dinner, have a baking competition, top chef, um, fancy dinner party. There's all sorts of ways. Um, there's free art classes, yoga, gymnastics. So just getting the whole family involved in it. Um, we've heard of the birthday parades, um, we've heard of the stuffed animal bear hunt, so anything we can do to be connected as a community, I think, um, in making light of this situation is, is important right now. Well, now that, now that you've given that perfect ending to be, to be kind and to work together as a community, I want to thank the three of you again, you experts, Lynn Cox, mm -hmm. Taylor Flurry, and Katie Vadova for really um, sharing some, some best practice strategies with us. And um, I look forward to talking more. But for now, I'm going to end the recording and we can stay online and say goodbye there. Great. Thanks, Thanks Lisa. <laughs>